Today our readings uh, will be a couple of passages, one from Isaiah 53, and then the next one in 1 Peter chapter 2. Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, is commonly known as the suffering servant. And so this is used uh, mostly uh, to remember the sufferings and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the word of the Lord from Isaiah 53, beginning with verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And then from First Peter chapter 2, we will read beginning with verse 21. The word of the Lord from First Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow his, in his footsteps. He committed no sin, neither was defeat, uh, deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and to live, live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, may your Holy Spirit illumine our minds to understand your word of truth about you and your Son, Jesus Christ, and keep them in our hearts. Amen. Beloved Congregation of Christ, from the Garden of Eden to the future end of the world, believers had always suffered persecution and martyrdom at the hands of the enemies of God and Christ. Unbelieving Cain martyred his faithful brother. And close to the return of Christ from heaven, these sufferings will come to a terrible climax. So that our Lord Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 24, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. The New Testament tells us that two of the apostles were executed. Paul was executed by the Roman Emperor Nero, and uh, he spoke many times in his letters. James was the first to be executed by King Herod Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod, who ordered the massacre of infant boys after Jesus was born. The other nine apostles were also martyred, but only according to early church tradition. We don't read about their martyrdom in the New Testament. Only one apostle, John, was not martyred as he died in exile in the island of Patmos when he was about 90 to 100 years old. Therefore, Christians started suffering for their faith during the earliest days of the church. And we know that in the early church, empire-wide 
persecution of Christians only stopped when Emperor Constantine declared Christianity as a legal religion in 321 AD. But thousands and thousands of believers were already martyred by that year. One of the lesser known martyrs were called the skeleton martyrs. Skeleton martyrs. They uh, were 12 Christians, seven men and five women, who refused to worship the emperor and were therefore executed in Carthage in Africa in 180 AD. They lived in an area called Scylium in present-day Algeria and Tunisia. Their martyrdom is found in a document called the Acts of the Skeleton Martyrs, the earliest Christian document in Latin North Africa. In their testimony in court, these faithful Christians declared that they live peaceful and moral lives, they paid their taxes, and they did no wrong to their neighbors. But they will never worship anyone else except their Savior, Jesus Christ. The persecution and martyrdom of all true believers continued throughout the medieval period, mainly from the Roman Catholic Church that wielded absolute power over kings and people in churches. This persecution and martyrdom continued through the 16th century Protestant Reformation. In our times, Christians continue to suffer at the hands of hateful enemies of Christ, What's ironic, ironic is that in the name of religious tolerance, preaching the true gospel against sexual immorality, abortion, and many other heinous sins are not tolerated. In fact, teaching about all kinds of religions are allowed except anything about Christianity. Our Lord warned his disciples that these enemies who hated and crucified him will also hate his followers. In our text, Peter says that as Christ suffered, so shall all believers like us suffer. And in the sufferings for Christ, we are molded into righteousness. And so today our theme is stricken, smitten, and afflicted under three headings. So first, and I will uh, point you to our sermon notes. So firstly, Christ's calling to suffering. The focus of the first epistle of Peter is his call to Christians to persevere in the faith through sufferings. He says in uh, 412, chapter 4, 12, verse 12, that we must not be surprised when sufferings come. In chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, he commends Christians who rejoice in various trials, uh, who pass the test of genuine faithfulness. When we pass this test, Christ will reward us honor and glory at his return from heaven. So why is there so much suffering in the world for those who believe in the God of the Bible? It all goes back to the Garden of Eden when Adam fell into sin because of say, uh, Satan's temptation. The effects of Adam's fall are universal in extent and in time. All sin from that time forward until the end of the world. And all creation is corrupted. God allows sin as part of his plan for saving his people. He also tests his people to strengthen them. Peter says that Christians are grieved by various trials to test the genuineness of your faith in chapter 1, verse 7. He even says later in chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And so Peter exhorts us in verse 21 of our text, 
For to this suffering you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow his steps. Christ's mission from his father is to suffer all throughout his life until his cruel death on the accursed tree. Christians often hear words of encouragement to emulate Christ's love, mercy, humility, meekness, kindness, patience, and all kinds of good works towards others. And we rightly must do so, even if we do not do this good works to attain heaven. These attributes and good works are instead the fruits of our salvation. But the call to emulate Christ's good attributes and, and works is not all. Christ's sufferings that started on Good Friday are also an example for us, so that you might follow in his steps. Peter quotes Isaiah 53, so a chapter that is often referred to as the suffering servant. Christ was despised and rejected by men. He was smitten, stricken by God, and afflicted. He was beaten, flogged, spat on, insulted, and utterly starved and thirsty before he was crucified. Through all these sufferings, he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter is silent. Throughout his life, all the way to the cross, he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And this is why Peter says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. During his last days with his disciples, Jesus' face was like flint looking forward at toward the great affliction that he was facing in Jerusalem. He predicted his suffering and death at the hands of hateful Jews and Romans three times. The third time, saying that he will be delivered over to the priests, uh, chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified in Matthew chapter 20. Elsewhere, Peter affirms, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Pontius Pilate even washed his bloody hands after judging Jesus, even after declaring that he was an innocent man. Our Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 44 explains that Christ descended into hell in order that, it says, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul on the cross, but also earlier has delivered me from hellish anguish and torment. And so his descent into hell was a symbolic of his unspeakable sufferings. Our catechism reading today also says about our Lord that during his whole life on earth, but especially in the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. So secondly, uh, firstly, Christ's calling to suffering. Secondly, Christians calling to suffering. So is there any Christian who is so meek as to be like our Lord, meek and silent, when he is being cursed, beaten, and tortured to death? The apostles might have, and so also those who suffered and were martyred in the early church, in the Reformation, and even during our time. But none of them would be sinless in life and in death like Christ. And if these sufferings and afflictions come to us, would we be able to be like him? 
Peter assure, uh, Peter assures us that yes, we are able if we only continue entrusting ourselves to Him, to God who judges justly, just as this Jesus did in the last days of His life. Our Lord, our Lord stressed our calling to suffering in His teachings. He knew that those who hated him will hate his disciples. They hated his good works and his condemnation of this dark world sin and unbelief. Therefore, if we also preach and teach what he preached and taught, the unbelieving world will hate us, persecute us, and make us suffer. He says that one of our blessings as Christians is persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He told his disciples in Matthew 5. Therefore, in John 15, 20, he warns us, If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And again in John 16, 33, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When Paul preached the gospel of repentance and faith, he also preached about the Christian's calling to suffer for Christ. In Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus himself said about him, about Paul, on the road to Damascus, For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. In Romans 8.17, Paul says that since Christ suffered and was glorified, we too will be glorified, but we must first suffer in this world. In 2 Thessalonians 1.5, he says that we are worthy of the kingdom of God for which we suffer. Paul cataloged his multitudes of sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11 and also in 2 Corinthians 6. He says this to us. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, Danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Can you imagine suffering like Paul did? But in all of these sufferings, Paul did not grumble against God and strike back against God's enemies. Therefore, Peter encourages us, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this, this suffering you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. We are called to suffering so that we may obtain blessing from God. And in our text, he exhorts us to endure sufferings. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. But our sufferings come not only in the form of persecution, reviling, and harassment. In this world, you might have a shack or a house, rags for clothes, and crumbs for dinner. 
like our brothers and sisters in Christ in most third world countries. You might have a broken home or an unfulfilling job or a terrible, painful disease or even worse, the ravages of war. Those are also life's sufferings. And lastly, third and lastly, Christians calling to righteousness. In uh, chapter 2, verse 12, he exhorts believers, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, even when unbelievers say that we are even doers. In doing good deeds, they might also believe and so glorify God on judgment. And so in, in our uh, sermon notes, I just noticed uh, in sermon note uh, chapter um, point three, um, a, in doing good deeds, unbelievers might, might also be something. Um, so this is a, a kind of a grammatical error. In doing good deeds, Christians might lead unbelievers to and B, E. So that's kind of a, I, I noticed that syntax, grammatical syntax error. So not only are we called to endure sufferings, but we are also called to live holy lives in this fallen world. Uh, Peter exhorts us not only to hope in the appearing of Christ, but also to be sober-minded, obedient, and holy as we wait for his appearing. As obedient children, he says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he called you is holy, so all you also be holy in all your conduct. Because God is holy, he requires his people to be holy, like Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. Because of his holiness, we cannot come before him in our sinful state, lest he will be defiled. Christ willingly suffered and died on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Because we are united to Christ's righteous life, we also must live in righteousness and holiness before him. Because we are united to him in death for our sins, we also must die to sin and flee from sin. Peter quotes Isaiah 53, 5, saying, By his wounds we are, you have been healed. By his sufferings and death we have been healed, not from physical diseases, but from our sins. Like sheep who stray away from safe and right paths, we are called by our good shepherd and overseer of our souls to leave our sinful ways. Paul exhorts us to rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. God sends us sufferings for discipline and testing of our faith, but he has also given us the Holy Spirit in all our sufferings. Are you willing to go through God's testing of your faith? Do you become bitter when they come? Do you lose hope because God has promised you will endure through the faith that he has given you? Your endurance does not come from you, but from the Spirit of Christ. And how do we endure? Peter says that we are being guarded through faith, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are guarded through faith, like witnesses to a crime who come under protective custody. God shields and protects us because we too bear witness to a crime scene, the crucifixion of Christ and the empty tomb. How does God protect us? The Holy Spirit 
He strengthens the faith that he has given us until Christ is revealed at the end of this age. Then all our sufferings will end. All enemies will be destroyed. And we will dwell securely in our Father's heavenly home. Persevering through trials is an almost impossible task in this fallen world with its passions of our former ignorance of Christ and his salvation. This is the world, uh, a world full of futile ways of people looking for salvation in other gods and philosophies and worldviews and trying their very best to go to heaven with their own goodness. And yet, this is God's command. And we know that through the Holy Spirit, we as Christians can live in holiness in this age while we wait for Christ's appearing in these last days. At the end of his first epistle, Peter sends us God's benediction through out our sufferings. He says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Our calling to earthly sufferings ends in our calling to eternal glory. So dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, this hope and holiness are only possible because of Christ's sufferings in this life and at the cross. All the worldly passions and futility are passing away. John says that this world is passing away with all its desires. We have been saved, born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. God saved us by faith alone in Christ alone to be holy, blameless, and righteous in his sight. But our salvation will not be completed until we endure sufferings to the end of our life. One thing that does not pass away, does not wither like grass and flowers, is the word of God. It is the seed that was planted in you by the Holy Spirit in our hearts, a seed that will never perish, never be defiled, and never fade. This word will remain forever. So why put your hope in things that will disappear when the resurrected Christ appears? Put your faith and hope in God. Live righteous and obedient lives in the fear of God. Love your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father in heaven, we have heard difficult but wonderful words from your holy scriptures. It is difficult for us to understand and accept that our calling in this world is to suffer for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ's sake that our sufferings are from the sin that came into this world through our forefather, Adam, and that our sufferings are sometimes your means of testing and strengthening our faith in you. But your word is also wonderful news for us who suffer because you promise that we will endure to the end and our reward for persevering in the faith is our eternal, glorious, heavenly home, and that we will endure because you have chosen us before the creation of the world and because the Holy Spirit applies the sufferings and death of your Son to our hearts, in whose name we pray. Amen.